Hello, YouTube. Welcome to another rendition of the Mass Free Thinker Show. And let's just jump right into the topic that I'm going to discuss. About a few years back, I read this book called The Camp of the Saints. It was, it's written by a man named John Raspell, who is in his 90s right now. He wrote, he published this book in 1973. He was inspired to uh, write this book when he was vacationing in the French Riviera in 1971. And he was thinking about uh, the problem of immigration that is going on in France. And he thought about how apocalyptic elliptic of a scenario would be if all if they came all of a sudden and in large numbers and he had this idea of this uh crisis that reached this apex where all these uh foreigners would just arrive just in mass and so overwhelm the sensibilities of the french people that they would be just taken over easily by this invading force but the subject matter of it is as i mentioned before is about uh, the immigration crisis mass migration that is going on in france and in europe in general and it's an apocalyptic and haunting vision of how the white race will be wiped off the face of the planet i don't care too much for this particular sentiment but nonetheless it is a pretty haunting description. And the New York Times said so. They even gave a review of the book in 1994, 21 years after it was written. A lot of the people in France held it as a, a very vivid and very detailed, descriptive book of an apocalyptic world where Western culture is pretty much wiped off the face of the planet. That is, the values of individual liberty and free speech and secularism are just gone. So if you don't want to be spoiled, this is going to be the spoiler right here, the synopsis of the book. It starts out, um, Belgium has taken in over 40,000 children from India, and the consulate in Calcutta announces that they would be cutting the child adoption program when they realized that the children were being adopted were being adopted uh, from mothers who were just wanting to give up their children so they could live in the West and live a better life. And so the this holy man who John Raspell describes as being a turd eater stands outside this the Belgian consulate in Calcutta. He's a very grotesque and deformed looking man and urges the crowd to storm the consulate, and they do. They end up killing everybody inside and what have you. And then the mob took control of about a hundred rusty ships, and the mob numbers a million or more. So they take aboard these ships, that, and they head for Europe. There's a lot of consternation and debate about this. Should we let all the refugees in? Some say that's this is this is more of a labor force coming in, and it will it will it will revive the flagging West. While others saying it's going to pretty much kill off the West. It, they're going to vote in their best interest whenever they get to a certain age to vote, and that's that's just the way it is. They they'll they'll vote against the values of Western democracy, and so. As they head towards the Suez Canal, the Egyptian government fires a warning shot, and they're turned away. So they have to head south or through the through the Gulf of the Gulf of Aden and whatnot, and they end up uh, at the end of the Indian Ocean, where South Africa is at. So the South African government surprisingly tried to deliver supplies and food and what have you to the to the people boarding the ships but they throw the food overboard and the west praises the f migrants for throwing the food overboard so that because they didn't want to accept food from the apartheid government of south africa so they edge closer and closer to france they e even reject the supplies from sao tom i'm not sure why exactly they did that but anyways they reject the supplies from sao tom 
And the Pope gets aboard his ship, who is from Brazil, and the mob storms the Pope, strangle him to death, and throw him overboard. And the press tries to hide the incident and minimize it, but everybody knows that the Pope was just killed for no particular reason by this mob. And so they touch down the shore of France, and you have this one, one woman who is holding a sign. There's all these leftists and all these hippies. The main character is a professor who kind of ruminates on this, like in between what the scene that's being described. And so this girl is holding up the sign, and as soon as they get off the ships, the people holding the signs saying, refugees welcome, refugees are the best things since sliced bread, they're all overwhelmed, they're killed. And the women that are captured and turned into sex slaves, and the one the one woman died in a whorehouse, being the sex slave of a bunch of migrants. While this is going on, the French government had a chance to turn these people back. But the French president puzzlingly made an announcement to the French military, use your best conscience, instead of giving the orders to mow them all down. So at the same time, there's riots taking place amongst the Africans and the Arabs that are already in France. And also at the same time, there are riots going on in New York City, in Harlem. And... Three families from Harlem end up sharing the Gracie Mansion, which is the mansion that the governor of New York lives in, with the governor of New York. And a Pakistani family forces the queen to marry her child off to the Pakistani family. And you have one drunken soldier in the Soviet Union in Siberia trying to uh, fend off thousands of Chinese streaming into Siberia. And also you have at the very end of the book, you know, fleets of Filipinos and Indonesians heading towards Australia and New Zealand. So pretty much this is just a simultaneous attack against all so-called westernized or developed or modern nations with uh, secular uh, governments and secular value. The, the, uh, at the current time, John Ralph Spell's book is being pretty much being prophetic. It's very prescient, especially the situation of the migrant crisis in Germany and Sweden and Britain. You have over 1,400 children being trafficked as sex slaves and rather them over a 10-year period by some Pakistani immigrants. But the British government did not want to take any action because they didn't want to be seen as racist over it. And in Sweden, you have... Uh, Migrant to gangs that uh, you had a, a group of migrants that raped a Swedish girl live on Facebook, and in Cologne, Germany, you had uh, New Year's New Year's Eve uh, mass rapes that went on in Cologne, Germany, and it was because of migrants and their culture. The problem, you know, with this book, you know, it is racially charged. It can be considered bilious, but it nonetheless proves a point and isn't necessarily wrong. Camp of the Saints, uh, it's, it's almost prophetic in its sense that what's going on in Europe is a culture that is very counter and very, for a lack of a better term, very uh, undemocratic. And very, and very um, antithetical to Western values. In Islam, they're taught that uh, the unbeliever is worthy of death, and that you should kill the unbeliever. Me being an atheist, that's quite troubling, considering that I'm the unbeliever to the utmost. I'm, I'm a staunch anti-theist. I'm against religion and all its pomps and forms. And so you have a culture. Yeah, this isn't a subculture. The difference between a subculture and a counterculture, Paul Watson talked about how the right is a counterculture, but that's sort of digressing to the point what I'm talking about here. Uh, a counterculture is a lot more threatening. And Muslims in Europe, 35% of Muslims in Britain, believe that 
Brit Britain should be under Sharia law. And there's probably, probably a lot of Muslims throughout Europe that would want their new homelands to be under Sharia law. They want to change society to fit their needs, especially if you look at certain countries like Sweden and Germany and France and Britain, you get to the point if there's enough of them in your country, they'll demand that your supermarkets carry halal meat and your cafeterias don't serve pork or your street vendors don't serve pork because you don't want to offend the Muslims that are living in your country. They do not come to Britain. A lot of them don't come to assimilate and to become British or to become German if they arrived in Germany and etc. and so forth. They instead demand that their new homeland adopt their values. As a matter of fact, in the Quran it said that there will be peace will reign on earth when everyone submits to Allah. Everyone converts to Islam. Matter of fact, if you look at the two camps that you're talking about, when you're referring to the, the Quran, there's the Dar al Hab, which is the house of war, which is everyone that isn't Islamic. And there's the Dar al Salam, which is everyone that's, is, that's Islamic or the house of peace, how it's literally translated. And so you have a culture that is diametrically opposed to the West. A lot of the migrants do not want to adopt Western culture. They hate Western culture. They don't respect the idea that gays have rights. They don't respect the idea that women have rights. They don't respect the idea that people are free to worship anything they want or not to worship anything at all like me. They do not respect that whatsoever. But the problem is, it's not necessarily just them, but the bigger problem is the governments like Britain which that might change after Brexit ha will officially happen in France, Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands somewhat. They do not make demands that those arriving in their countries conform to their values and to conform to at least recognize that certain people have liberty. The amount of crime that has, in has increased Rapes have went up exponentially since the arrival of migrants starting in 2006 in Sweden. In Germany, various terrorist attacks, including the the Christmas the Christmas market attack in Berlin that killed uh, numerous people, and in France, it was probably their bloodiest year when you're talking about terrorist attacks. Matter of fact, every time a terrorist attack is committed, like it was recently done in Westminster Bridge in London. You have many Muslims around the world on Facebook, thumbs up, smiling, cheering, saying, Allah Wakbar, God is great, cheering these attacks, because this is all part of jihad, and jihad means just simply struggle. This is a jihad against those who are non-believers, the so-called infidels, the kafirs. We are kafirs. If you're not a Muslim, then you're a kafir. And matter of fact, about 83% of the Quran is and the Hadith and the Sira, the three big books of the Islamic faith, is about how to deal with the kafir, the unbeliever. I, I'm sort of getting off the point when it's talking about the camp of the saints and how it relates to it. But John Raspell says the main cause of how the West will fall is because of our altruism and, to foreigners and our apathy towards our own culture and our own people. There are many in the Western world, especially these postmodernists and uh, neo-Marxist feminist people like that, that hate their own culture and hate Western values because they're taught in grade school, like I was, that their culture, their nations are inherently evil because of our years of colonialism and slavery and subjugation of people abroad and the interfering of politics abroad, like with the United States and Iran and Guatemala, and etc. And France, when it relates to Algeria, France is, has a lot of blood on its hands. Britain has a lot of blood on its hands. Germany certainly has a lot of blood on its hands. Spain, etc. But, but you know what? That's not necessarily so cut and dried, but you can't really tell the cultural Marxists that, the neo-Marxists that is. You can't tell them that. And there's this loathing of their own culture. 
even though they enjoy the ability to mock and deride and criticize their culture under the blanket of freedom of speech in all the Western nations and nations that have secular values that puts the idea of the individual first before the collective. But you have in Camp of the Saints and currently the left acti actively suppresses any instance of violence that Islam commits and saying, no, not all Muslims. No, not all. Even though in the Quran, it commands them to kill people that are not of the faith. That's just the problem with the left when it comes to criticizing Islam is that they don't recognize that the inherent problem of, is of Islamists is the faith itself, Islam. They would gladly criticize, say, a Christian uh, dominionist who bombs an abortion clinic or shoots abortion doctors like uh, like uh, Paul Paul uh, Paul Jennings Hill and Eric Rudolph, who bombed and shot abortion doctors respectively. And so you have them criticizing Christians who are on the extreme and saying, "Oh, Christianity is a terrible faith. Christianity is, is so patriarchal." It is. Christianity is shit, but when you're talking about in relation to the world, Christians generally tend to coexist much better with other peoples than Muslims do. And you look at the law of Islamic saturation, and you look at the Quran, they're commanded not to live in peace with the, those of a different faith. Even when you're talking about, like, Moorish Spain, the Catholics and Jews of Spain had to pay zakah. No, they had to pay the jizya in order to still practice their faith. But if they didn't pay their jizya, they would end up uh, being put in jail or killed. So it wasn't so cut and dried that Spain had a great cultural renaissance, which it did, but under the rule of the Moors, but it just wasn't so cut and dried. But as mentioned before, subculture, which... Kind of a lot of your leftists, especially, would consider the United States, the Muslim people, to be part of their own subculture. But you already see an enclave in places like Dearborn, Michigan, that have their own communities and pretty much enforce their own rules and laws and whatnot. And throughout Europe, you have neighborhoods in Germany. You have over 100,000 Turks living in a certain neighborhood. You wouldn't even know you were in Germany. You'd think you're in Turkey. If you were blindfolded and airdropped in this neighborhood, you thought you were in Turkey because you see nothing but Turkish flags. You see nothing, uh, you hear nothing but Turkish being sp spoken. You'd think you're, you weren't living in Germany. And, you, and in London, you have certain neighborhoods like Luton that have Sharia police. If, if you're a, caught with a beer in your hand you get harassed by the local muslim population and if uh, you're a woman you wear a skirt that's kind of revealing you're called a slut and ran out of your neighborhood and so on and so forth they start from these con enclaves and flow outward and so in respect john raspail uh, is kind of right when he's talking about how hegemonic certain cultures are and how they would end up supplanting the West, which is a sad commentary because this is what's kind of happening right now in Europe. You have so many migrants that are so antithetical to Western values and Western democracy, but the left shields these people and calls anyone, like it mentions in Camp of the Saints, xenophobic or Islamophobic, or a racist, or a bigot, if you try to bring this up. Some interesting, other interesting parallels in the book is the Pope, as I mentioned before, he's from Brazil. Our current Pope is from Argentina. He's from South America, just like the Pope in the Camp of the Saints. And so, like the Pope in the Camp of the Saints, the Pope demands that Europe take in more migrants, be more charitable, be more virtuous towards the migrants. Uh, and like the Pope in Brazil in Camp of the Saints, the Pope of today, Francis I from Argentina, he's a far leftist. He is a liberation theocracy uh, follower to the upteenth. He believes that 
uh, poverty is, is a sin and rich people are just so evil. He does not believe in private wealth or private enterprise, but yet he sits on his opulent throne in Rome and snipes down from it and tries to be the moral busybody. So you have the social justice warriors who will criticize you for making mention of how dangerous Islam is. Just look at what happened with Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins. Pretty much alienated from their fellow atheists, because a lot of atheists, unfortunately, are social justice warriors. When I first read this book, I just thought of how vile it was and how racist it was and venomous it was. And it was back during my days when I was a social justice warrior. And you are sort of inculcated in this mindset of the social justice warrior going to university. University is about the worst place you can send your child because they will be so brainwashed and indoctrinated by these fucking professors who do not give a shit about the West. A bunch of postmodernist libtards who despises everything about the West and lauds everything from a vile culture that does not want to uh, have any nation on the planet live under democracy, but instead live under Islamic law. Granted, the people in the book were Indians, and the Indians end up uh, swamping all of Europe. But um, I don't have any problem with Indians in particular. They assimilate quite well into whatever culture that they live in, and they become part of it. There's British Indians and there's uh, Indians in America that assimilate quite well and are quite hardworking and very industrious. I don't even have a problem with Muslims as long as they recognize that there are other people and they have an inherent right to be what they want to be without them trying to dictate to them that they cannot criticize their faith because it might hurt their fee-fees or what the fuck ever. I don't give a fuck about how hurt you be if I criticize your faith. Fuck you. That's the way I feel about it. And so, other points of contention. You have this professor who is most likely in Switzerland. It's the last refuge. And it's funny how Switzerland is always this buffer. It was a buffer in World War One. It was a buffer in World War Two, And throughout its history, it's allowed certain groups to live insular, but yet develop their culture safely because it's geographically it's surrounded by all these mountains and it's hard to invade. But Switzerland is condemned by the new governments that is being a, a rogue state, not allowing the migrants. So eventually Switzerland capitulates and the last camp of the saints is pretty much burnt to the ground because the title of the camp of the saints come from the book of Revelation where these people make their last stand and they're just consumed in these flames. And so this may not happen all of a sudden like it happened in Camp of the Saints, but it is happening right now. Sweden is dying. Germany is dying. Britain, I think, is at least trying to stave off the tide. France may do so if Marine Le Pen is elected. Uh, currently, the United States, you have Muslims being a subculture. They're sort of non-threatening, but quite a few of them would like America to be more under Sharia law and to have more of their own laws and customs in place instead of the predominant uh, Western values. And you have the second generation of Muslims like Omar Mateen and the attacker for the San Bernardino attacks being radicalized. And partly it's because of the internet, largely actually, it's because of the internet and they have access to ISIS propaganda. So it threatens the West too. Canada right now is just allowing migrants in mass and they're not even doing any kind of vetting or whatsoever. Refugees welcome, multi -culty. Justin Trudeau believes that his nation will be a shining example of what a post-nationalist nation looks like. But he doesn't recognize the fact that all these differing groups already have certain animosities towards each other. You know, Tunisians aren't exactly friendly with the Egyptians or the Somalians. 
and you have all these people coming in from this various different groups. India, especially India, has long-standing conflict, especially with its Bora Muslim population in Pakistan. And you throw them all together, and you expect them to coexist. Diversity is our strength. I don't think so. They end up forming their own communities, self-ghettoized communities, and they're hostile towards each other. Just like in Europe, you have self-ghettoized Islamic communities that are hostile to non-Muslims. Matter of fact, in 2015, 7,000 Jews had to leave France because of the violence and the outright intimidation by the native Muslim population. And Europe should, of all places, should be a safe haven for Jews because of all the, because of all the hardships and tribulations that they've endured, including the Holocaust and all the various pogroms and all the anti-Semitism. But they can't keep their native Jew population safe from the rising tide of probably what is the most anti-Semitic of all ideologies, and that's Islam. Islam pretty much has a monopoly on terrorism, too. Majority of your major terror attacks, almost all of them, are committed by Muslims. In second place, communism, which is funny because the far left is becoming the useful idiots of Islam. They are a Trojan horse to Islamists coming into the country because the left shields them away from any kind of criticism. Any criticism, like what happened with Sam Harris and Ben Affleck, Sam Harris and Bill Maher, uh, when they're arguing with Ben Affleck, are, they were labeled bigots, Islamophobes, while Ben Affleck was being lauded as a hero. And you have your apologists like Reza Aslan, who pretty much muddies the conversation to the point where you get mired in apologia instead of talking about the real issue, which is Islam. And so another sticking point in the book where John Raspell talks about this river of sperm. So, like I mentioned before, I, maybe I haven't mentioned it yet, but Islam is a very patriarchal and very hyper-masculine culture that's definitely for men of men and by men. And they believe in honor. And honor is the most important thing in the world. That's why you have honor killings, especially with females who stray outside of marriage or refuse to be part of an arranged marriage or anything if they wanted to go to school or have an education that's dishonoring the family and so honor is very important in this culture and honorable thing in the world to do is to kill whoever dishonors your faith because dishonoring the prophet muhammad is worthy of death and this hyper masculinity takes over in males including the fathers or the grandfathers or the cousins or the brothers and they take the female out and they kill her so and you see europe being o western western nation being overly effeminate very feminized to the point where they lack the intestinal fortitude to stand up for their nations and to defend their values they just let these people overwhelm them which comes part and parcel like with what happened with the Roman Empire. You have a, over a hyper masculine culture amongst the barbarian tribes that overwhelm the capital of Rome. And Rome by 455 AD is non existent. Are we seeing the fall of Rome? Will we be seeing the fall of Western values from a I, an ideology that is so diametrically opposed to Western values to the point where they don't want Western values. They want the society that they live in to adopt to their values and cucked out nations like Sweden capitulate. And it's very sad. My, my solution to any of this going on right here is reaffirming your national identity. I don't really care too much for ethnic identity. Uh, you've had that happen in, in Germany and in Italy during World War before World War Two and during World War Two and they ended disastrous that disastrous. I respect the nation that puts its values as part of its national identity. America in my home nation definitely puts free speech as a as part of its core national identity, the freedom of religion, the freedom of conscience as enshrined in the Constitution. Europe needs to 
take root of this if it is to survive. It's not happening in an acute way, but this is a chronic disease that needs to be treated or else it will metastasize to the point where it's almost all but too late to fight back. You even have various Islamic uh, clerics declaring that places like Brussels will be an Islamic capital by 2030. And you have huge enclaves of neighborhoods in Germany that aren't even recognizable as German. And you have in Sweden whole neighborhoods that are just taken over by foreigners, by the is by the Muslim migrants from places like North Africa and Pakistan. And they can flaunt the law because of the fact that uh, the law ha is toothless and does not enforce any of its uh, rules and regs. Matter of fact, they end up apologizing and, and capitulating because they don't want to be seen as racist. They're too busy bur virtue signaling instead of trying to protect their own people. So overall, I think Camp of the Saints has become very prescient for its for the time period. It's mentioned by Steve Bannon, the chief strategist for Donald Trump in the White House, as a book that everyone should read. It's a you know, in so many ways, it's a cautionary tale of the things to come. It will the West survive? I don't know. Not unless we take hold of national values. One thing I can say for sure, maybe Generation Z will give us some hope. They're becoming more conservative and don't care too much for the cultural hegemony of the far left in academia, in the media, in, in Hollywood, and all various cultural outlets, the music industry, all controlled by the far left. This is about all that I have. Again, I am the Mass Free Thinker, and if you like this video, hit that like button. If you want to subscribe, hit that subscribe button. If you want to see more content from me, please share this video. And if you have any thoughts on my video or in what I say and how I do it, leave some comments down below. I'm open to all comments i will not censor you and again as always throw all the cups out youtube <laughs> youtube spear six semper tyrannis the graffiti says it all welcome to belgistan muslims are still a minority in belgium but in the capital of brussels they're already the largest religious group one quarter of the city's population and are expected to be the majority in less than 20 years. The most confrontational Muslim group here is Sharia for Belgium, which used shouting and threats to shut down a debate by moderate Muslims a few months ago. I sat down and talked to the leader of Sharia for Belgium, Faud Baukasem, alias Abu Imran. Sharia for Belgium is a small group that a lot of people don't take seriously. But he sounded very serious when he told me that he expects Muslims to rule Belgium and the world. We believe that the Sharia will do dominate. The Sharia will be implemented worldwide. Sharia for Belgium is a public relations nightmare for those Muslim groups which try to play down their ties to radicalism and Sharia law. Imran was completely open with CBN News, saying Islam and Sharia law are inseparable and democracy is wrong. Sharia is Islam, to be clear. There is no difference between Islam and Sharia. It's just a name. Uh, uh, democracy is the opposite of, of, Islam, of, of Sharia and Islam. We believe that Allah is the legislator. Allah makes the laws. He is the one who tells us what's allowed and what's forbidden. I know some Muslims who think of themselves as Democrats and they say they're against Sharia. Are they real Muslims? Yeah, that's it's really funny when I uh, hear someone saying, yeah, I, I was speaking to a democratic Muslim. It's the same thing as saying I, I was speaking to a Christian Jew or to a Jewish Muslim or something like that. It's impossible. H how could you meet a Jewish Muslim or a Christian?